good. And then we have a potluck next week. So uh, what can I say? All right. Well, um, I, I believe that's all the announcements that I have. I, I think I've covered almost everything. So if I forgot something, uh, read. You, you all know how to read, right? Does, that, does anybody here not know how to read? Uh, okay, so read, read your bulletins. All right, I'm going to dismiss the children to Children's Church uh, right now, and uh, they're going to follow Susan out. And uh, meanwhile, I'm going to have Jim Nelson come on up here, and he's going to be reading from the book of John, the Gospel of John, and he'll be in chapter 1. And, uh, and in your bulletin, I think it actually says uh, four, uh, 14 through 17, but actually it's 18. So if you read 18 as well. I'll be on the screen. Yes, please, if you'd stand in the reading of God's word. So it's 1 John 14 through 18. I'm sorry, Gospel of John. Yeah, one John. Oh, it's the first. Is the Gospel of John? Yeah, John one. Oh, not the first John. Excuse me. All right, uh, 14 to 18. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is the, at the Father's side, he has made him known. So if you join me in a prayer. Lord, you are God alone. And we thank you for the ransom that you paid through your son, Jesus Christ, of his willingness to go to the cross. Help us to put on our armor each day and to stand for you. Help us to fight with faithful and with value. Help us to be good and faithful servants and to spread your word to those who we come in contact with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jim. This morning we're going to be talking about the incarnation of Christ. Uh, it's a deep subject. I call this message, God with us. This topic is very important. This doctrine is probably the most controversial doctrine that you will encounter in life. It's controversial because many will argue about the person of Jesus. You see, this is critical to our faith. Who is Jesus? Now, I know that uh, in Christian circles, we, we bring up secondary issues like rapture and millennium and other, other 
inflammatory kind of, kind of uh, subject, creation and those sorts of things, and people get, take sides and get angry about them. But you know what? This topic is life and death. The others are peripheral, and we can get along and agree to disagree, but on this one, you cannot disagree. Because if you disagree, you have the wrong Jesus. And dare I say, if you have the wrong Jesus, you do not have salvation. If you don't understand who Jesus really is, you cannot have salvation. Now, people can be ignorant, and that's okay, as long as they're teachable and begin to understand a little bit more about Jesus. But when a doctrine like this comes into your purview, you have a choice. The choice is accept it or reject it. And if you reject it, it is clear you don't have the right Jesus. Now, think about, I think about when I was a child, I grew up in a Christian home, and I accepted Christ as my Savior when I was five. Did I understand the incarnation? No. But I did understand that Jesus was God. And he died on the cross to pay for my sin. So as we approach this subject, I want you to be convinced that Jesus is God who took on humanity. Salvation only comes through a relationship with Jesus. Not just the historical Jesus. Not a Jesus who's just a prophet. Not a Jesus who's just a man. Jesus is much more. Jesus is God the Son. And his death counts for something. And if we don't understand who Jesus is, his death is for nothing. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about Jesus in the context of the, the, um, the Passover, right? Uh, Easter. We're also going to be talking about the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday. Why? are these two events, Palm Sunday and Easter, so important? Because of who Jesus is. Palm Sunday declares Jesus as the victor, the, the king. And Easter declares a risen Savior, not a dead Savior. That's why this topic is so important today. Now, we've been talking over the past few weeks about Jesus, and what we're finding here in this prologue of the Gospel of John is the declaration of who Jesus is. And John is very clear that Jesus is God. And in verse 14, what we begin to see is that God took on humanity. And so, as we come to our text today in John chapter 1, verse 14, and it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What we need to do today is begin to unpack this text. These Four verses, five verses that we're going to be talking about this morning are important, so important that this verse is probably 
the most important verse when it comes to the incarnation of Christ, along with some others. But this verse is critical that we understand it. Now, John explained earlier in verse 1 that the Word became flesh and the world, the Word, or here in verse 14, that the Word became flesh and the world and the and dwelt among us. And we know from the context that he's talking about Jesus. The question that needs to be answered today is how did the Word become flesh? Now we know from Matthew and we know from Luke that Jesus was born of a virgin conceived by the Holy Spirit. So let's look at those passages briefly. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, it goes like this. Now while he thought about these things, it's talking about Joseph, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for what has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. So we hear from, or so what we see here in Matthew chapter 1 is the announcement to Joseph of what's going on with Mary. And what the angel says is that this child who is to be born named Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit. In Luke, we read a similar account, but this account is of Mary's encounter with the angel. And in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, it says, Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and, he shall be call, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of of the highest. So here in both of these accounts what we have is that Mary was to conceive by the Holy Spirit. And his name is to be Jesus, which means God saves. So in in Luke we also read in verse 35, And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So here in our text, we find that in both Matthew and Luke, we have the conception of this holy child to be by the Holy Spirit. Now we've established already over the last few weeks is that the Word is none other than God who has come down in the flesh. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He is the Creator and he came in the flesh in verse 14 of our text. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now here in this, this phrase, the word became flesh, we have to understand what does the word became mean? It, it implies his pre-existence, and we've already established that, but it's important that we see it even here in this context. That the word became flesh is not that he is a created being and became a being, but he has come in the flesh, that the word became flesh. Who is the word? Jesus. And he is now coming in the flesh. This important doctrine of the incarnation of Jesus 
actually includes Jesus and his nature. The rest of this verse actually gives us a picture of Jesus' nature. Who is Jesus? It is our belief that Jesus is fully God and fully man, and the doctrine is called the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union is a doctrine that helps us to understand that Jesus is fully God and fully man. A hundred percent God and a hundred percent man. The eternal Son took on humanity to be born of a woman. <clears throat> we see here in verse 14 that God dwelt among us. Going back to the verse, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it is God who comes and dwells with us. <clears throat> God lived on earth. Here John wrote, we beheld his glory. Notice that glory only belongs to God. God is the only one who can receive glory, who has glory. And John says here that we beheld his glory. Whose? Jesus' glory. God in the flesh. John said we beheld, meaning that the word who became flesh had glory. And then he expanded on that when he wrote the glory of the only begotten of the Father to help us understand that this is one in essence with the Father. The only begotten means unique, without equal, one of a kind. So sometimes people go, they think of the word begotten as something that is born in a sense of like we are. And yet there is an aspect of that, but there is also the preexistence. But it means that he is unique, without equal, one of a kind. It does not imply that he is created, as some have suggested. The phrase, full of grace and truth, means that he lacks nothing as God in the flesh. Now, it's interesting that some have suggested that Jesus gave up his deity, God gave up his deity when he came in the flesh. But that would be a wrong understanding of Jesus. Because it says here that he was full of grace and truth, meaning that he lacked nothing. You see that he is all God. 100% God, lacking nothing. I want to skip forward to verse 18 because this is important. There's some other stuff in between we're going to work through, but I want to jump to verse 18 because I want to talk about it here. We, mean, we read more about the deity of Jesus in verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. In this verse, we have the statement, no one has seen God at any time. In the Old Testament, there were several, several examples of people who had encounters with God. So how is it this is possible? How is it that John could say, no one has seen God at any time, when there have been clear examples in Scripture of people who have had encounters with God. And here's some examples. Abraham, Jacob, Gideon, 
and Samson's parents. That's just to name a few. I could go through the whole list. But the point here is that they had an encounter and they realized we've seen God. So how is it that John could say no one has seen God at any time? Well, this goes to the doctrine of God the Father as been being without a body, incorporeal. Doesn't have a body. So you can't see God in these with these eyes. He's invisible. So how is it that they saw God? What we find is in the Old Testament, whenever someone had an encounter with God, it was usually an angel who appeared to them and is described as the angel of the Lord. And they would see this the angel of the Lord. And they would realize afterward that they had seen God. Theologians call this a theophany. A theophany is when God appears in a body. And many have equated the theophanies as being none other than Christ. before he took on humanity. So he looked like a person. And it was clear from the text that the, that the individuals that had an encounter with the angel of the Lord realized we have just seen God. The theophany. Now if we think about the close relationship that God had with Moses. We would now understand a little bit more about this idea that no one has seen God at any time. When Moses asked God, can I see your face? God said, no. God says, but I'll let you see my train as I go by. You'll get to see the back as I pass by. Here is probably the person who has the greatest connection with God, communed with God. God spoke to him, gave him the Ten Commandments, written with the finger of God, the Bible says wouldn't let him see his face. When Moses saw the backs as, G as God passed by, his face was glowing so much that he had to wear a veil because the people couldn't Handle looking at Moses, and he wore a veil the rest of his life. So, what is John talking about? No one has seen God at any time, and yet here is the Son, God in the flesh, God taking on humanity. Have we seen God? Well, the answer is yes and no. No, because no one has seen God. He's incorporeal. But we've seen Christ. So what does Jesus say to Philip, who's asking him, show us the Father. I love this verse, these verses in Philippians. Or, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back to my notes. I'll get back to that eventually. But Paul explained in Philippians 2 a little bit more about Jesus. 
In Philippians 2, he says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. So going back to our verse 18, sorry about getting ahead of myself. I get excited. John says, he has declared him. So, who has declared God, Jesus, in his body while he walked around on the earth? He is the express image of the Father. Not only that, but they share the same essence. So, when Paul explained in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7, that he was in the form of God, that is, this that he is one in essence with the Father. The Holy Trinity has always been God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have forever existed. God, one God in three persons, in perfect harmony and perfect unity, has always existed. And Jesus, the second person, the Son, the eternal Son, has come in the form of a man. He took on humanity. So we have to ask ourselves, what did Jesus give up? What did the Son give up when he came to earth? And the answer is nothing. Absolutely nothing. He, he gave up nothing. He didn't give up his deity at all. He is still 100% God. God took on humanity, which is an addition. The fact is that he made himself of no reputation, as Paul says. He took on humanity and he kept his deity intact. Since the Father and the Son are in perfect unity, yes, Jesus never acted on his own accord. But because they're in perfect unity, one God in three persons, Jesus did what the Godhead wanted. But I want to give you some examples of how that Jesus never gave up anything. Because he proved that he had power over nature when he calmed the sea of Galilee. Mark 4, 41. And they feared exceedingly and they said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? It doesn't say that it obeyed God. Jesus prayed a prayer and says, Hey God, can you stop the... The, the storm, no, Jesus just said, storm, stop. And you know how waves are? Even after the wind dies down, uh, they keep rippling for a while. It says it was perfectly calm. Everything just, psh, the storm was over. Instantaneously. It didn't calm down, it just was over. It's, it's all done. Back to normal. And he proved his creative power when he gave sight to the man born blind, which we'll study in the future in John chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Look what he does. The creator of the universe does this. When he said these things, he spat on the ground, made clay with his saliva, and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which, he, which is translated since. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Do you understand what just happened here? God used the materials to create, that he created mankind with, Adam and Eve, and he regenerated new eyes, for this man. He gave him new eyes. The creator. Did Jesus give up anything when he became a man? Did God give up anything here? No. 
He's still God. He still has creative power. Jesus proved his power over disease when he healed the man with leprosy. There's many examples of this, but I picked one. Matthew chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. And behold, the leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Completely, immediately his leprosy was cleansed. In the Old Testament, we have examples of God doing this where someone, would, uh, uh, Moses stuck his hand in his cloak, pulled it out, it was leprous, put it back, pulled it out, it was clean. God's done this before. And we know that it's God that's doing this. Not only does he have power over disease, but he also has power over demons. The creator of the universe has power over demons and angels, but here in Luke chapter 8, we see his power over demons. There's this man who had demons, and they're called legion. There were so many of them. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not condemn them to go into the abyss. In other words, God is the only one who has the power to send them to the abyss. And he doesn't carry that out because it's not his purpose yet, but he will someday send them to the abyss. Jesus never gave up anything. He is still 100% God. And the demons obeyed him. And of course, we know that he had power over death. Not just his own, which we'll look, about, look at in just a few, but over others. He brought Lazarus back to life. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forward. The joke is, if he hadn't said, Lazarus, come forth, everybody would have come out of the tomb. Which is probably true. But the intention was to bring back Lazarus after four days, because after four days, he was really dead. He has power over death. And Jesus declared the Father to the world. Philip asked. Here's where I got ahead of myself. In John chapter 14, verse 9, Philip says, Show us the Father. Jesus said to him, Have, you been with, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who sent me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? I love this verse. Because it reminds us that Jesus is God and he is the incarnation of God. He didn't give up anything when he came to earth. Since Jesus is God, we have a relationship with God who took on humanity and went to the cross for us. Now we can prove that Jesus was human We've already proved that he's God, but we could prove that he's human because a lot of people like to think that Jesus wasn't really truly human. There's the two sides. Either Jesus wasn't really truly God and Jesus wasn't really truly human. And the both of them argue about that. And we have one person who is both. Critical to our understanding of who Jesus is because he had to be fully human. He was born like all of us, Luke 2, 7. He grew up like all of us, Luke 2, 52. He was tired like all of us, Luke 8, 30, 23. He was hungry like all of us, Luke 4, 2. He was thirsty like all of us, John 19, 28. And he bled and died like us. John 19, 30. But he didn't stay dead. Proving that he is God too. 
God loves his special creation, that's us, and he died for us, and he rose again, proving that he is God and that he has the power to forgive our sin. Because only God can forgive sin against God. And we've sinned against God, and God is the only one who can forgive us. And Jesus paid that penalty for us to forgive us of our sin. How do, I, how do we respond to this person, Jesus, God in the flesh? Put your faith and trust in him if you haven't already. Trust Jesus. In verse 15, we begin to read a little bit more about who Jesus is. Jesus is God preeminent. In verse 15, John presses the importance of knowing that Jesus is more important than John the Baptist. Look at verse 15. John bore witness of him and cried out saying, This, is, uh, this was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. On the surface, the significance of the statement made by John may not be completely apparent. In Luke 1, we find Mary, who is with child, visiting Elizabeth, who was a relative, the mother of John the Baptist, who was already pregnant five months, or six months, I, I don't know which. It's hard to tell the chronology there. But at least five months, perhaps six. And in the statement here, we see in verse 15, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, shows that John the Baptist knew and recognized Jesus' identity as God before he was ever created. John the Baptist, when he was still in the womb of his mother, leapt for joy when Mary showed up. John the Baptist started his ministry before Jesus. And he was born before Jesus. But he confesses that Jesus was before him. So it's not about birth order. It's about importance or preeminence. Jesus is more important than John the Baptist. The Apostle John put this quote from John the Baptist here in the context of verse 14, and the word became flesh, so we wouldn't miss the point. All the references that we've been looking at from the past few, the past few weeks are here to reinforce that Jesus is not a mere man. The apostle didn't want his readers to miss it. And John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet who declared Christ would come and we are to follow him, Jesus. John knew his place and he knew Jesus' place. Jesus is to be preferred before each of us. He is before all, not just in chronology, but in every way. Jesus proved his eternal nature by rising from the dead. Only God can bring back the dead, or even, more importantly, can rise from the dead himself. All three persons of the Holy Trinity were involved with the resurrection. The Father is said to have raised Jesus in Acts chapter 10, verse 40. Him, God, raised up on the third day and showed him openly. In John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Jesus claims to take up his own life. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. 
I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. This commandment I have received from my Father. And the Holy Spirit is said to be involved in raising Jesus from the dead in Romans chapter 1 verse 4. And declare to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. There are several others that, that all talk about the Holy Spirit's involvement in the resurrection. I just picked that one. Jesus being raised from the dead proves that he has preeminence. He is above all. And going back to Philippians chapter 2, verses 9, we see that here in these verses. So it's a repetition of these verses, but I want you to see it again. Therefore, God, who has highly exalted him, has given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow to those in heaven and to those on earth and to those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a continuation of that passage we looked at earlier. So here, Jesus is exalted above every name. Someday, everyone will know who Jesus really is. And for some, it will be too late. Jesus will rise us too. Not only did he come back from the dead himself, but he will take us and bring us back from the dead. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Knowing he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. That means that those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus will be raised to eternal life, to everlasting life. Because Jesus is eternal, he gives us eternal life if we trust in him as our Lord and Savior. In John 3.36 it says, He who, ha who believes the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. This is wonderful news for those who trust Jesus. Believers have everlasting life. The sad part is when they don't believe when they haven't trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. God's wrath is already upon them. And the only way that that wrath can be removed is through the blood of Jesus that is shed on the cross. It's about what we do with Jesus. If you're here today and you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus, you may want to. Don't put it off. If you're being drawn to Jesus right now, don't resist. Put your faith and trust in Jesus. The last two verses that we're going to talk about, we've already talked about verse 18, but I want to talk about verses 16 and 17 because it talks about Jesus being full of grace and truth. He is God, full of grace and truth. In these last two verses of our text, we see Jesus' mission. Verse 16, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John says that his fullness we have received. What is the fullness of God that we have received. We've received God in bodily form. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's a deep statement. That's a, a very important statement because it says that all the Godhead was revealed in Jesus Christ. John writes that Jesus brought grace for grace. This means limitless grace that comes through Jesus Christ. Going back to our verse in verse 16, it says, And of his fullness we have received and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
John compared what Jesus brought to Moses and what Moses brought. Moses brought the law which brings condemnation. The law condemns us. It shows us where we did wrong. It tells us that we cannot never be doing everything right. We all lie. We all take things that don't belong to us. We all covet what isn't ours. We don't give God the glory he deserves. And on and on it goes. We are lawbreakers. And because we are lawbreakers, we deserve death. And a, con a, a separation from God forever. Moses brought the law and through the law condemnation. But Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace abounds much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What this means is that even though the law condemns us, there's something even greater, and that's grace. Grace is that undeserved, unmerited favor of God. We do not deserve one thing from Him, and yet He chose to bestow, to give us grace. And it comes through Jesus. Eternal life comes through Jesus. Jesus brought something better than the law. He brought grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Was Moses important? Yes. Was the law important? Yes. It was there to show us that we cannot do it on our own. That we need a Savior. Grace and truth have their source in God alone. We can't get grace for salvation from anyone else but God alone. And he brings us this grace in truth. It's the truth. It's to be believed. It is to be trusted. That truth is that Jesus died on a cross to pay for our sin. God is the only one who can extend that grace and only God can be our source of truth. The world lives in lies and misdirection. The truth is that salvation is only found in Jesus. Acts 4.12 Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Grace and truth come from Jesus. God wants us to have a relationship with him and he sent his son, the second person of the Trinity who gave up nothing, took on humanity to die on a cross to pay for our sin. Jesus didn't stay dead and he rose again, proving who he really was. What Jesus did is beyond our ability to fully comprehend. The hypostatic union, fully God, fully man, made that possible. God in the flesh, who came, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God gave up nothing when he became flesh. Do you believe that? 
So what can be done with Jesus? What do you do with Jesus? You believe him. You trust him. It was his blood that paid for our sin. No matter how big it is, no matter how big our sin, we think in our own brain what it is. God paid for that. All of it. All the sins you've ever done, all the sins you'll ever do, he paid for that on the cross because his grace is bigger than our sin. What a wonderful hope that is, right? That confident expectation that we have in Jesus. Jesus is God with men. He is preeminent and he needs to be that in our life. He needs to be first and foremost in our life. Is he there? He is God full of grace and truth. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this opportunity we had today to just explore who Jesus really is. And we thank you that you took on humanity for us. That you were willing to live in these limit limited bodies and yet you exercised your godhead even through this limited body and you could have refused to go to the cross you could have gotten off the cross but you stayed there and you gave up your spirit in order to die on a cross to pay for our sin it it's just beyond our understanding. But Lord, we accept it. We believe it that you did this for us. And apart from you and what you did on the cross, we cannot have salvation. Thank you, Lord, for that salvation that we cannot earn or deserve. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming today. You're dismissed.